Bowers, would you call the roll? Mr. Harper? Here. Ms. Henry? Here. Mr. Kilgore? Here. Mr. Pearson? Here. Mr. Samuels? Present. Ms. Smith? Here. Ms. Mugler? Here. Let the record show that all school board members are in attendance. Uh, I will turn things over at this time to our student liaison to make some introductions. Vacation and say the pledge is Madeline Parr, a fourth grader at Spratly Gifted Center. Her favorite subject is math because she loves being able to solve problems on her own. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Hello, and thank you for having me here for the invocation tonight. I am Madeline Parr. I'm nine years old and a fourth grader at Sproutly Gifted Center. When I'm not in school, I enjoy performing in the school's musicals, and I am a champion Irish dancer at the Rhythm of Ireland School in Virginia Beach. Yesterday, I began a brand new school year for me and probably a lot of other kids. That meant a sleepless Monday night. Nerves and excitement for all the things that a new year brings kept me up for quite a while. New teachers, new classes, new kids, new challenges, and for a lot of people, new schools. That's a lot of new. Yesterday, my teacher, Ms. Farrell, let us watch some Kid President videos. If you don't know who Kid President is, you should check him out on YouTube. I like Kid President because he's funny. He's nine, just like me, and he has a lot of really important things to say to kids and adults. I thought that instead of reading a poem or a book, that I would give you a top 10 countdown of my favorite kid president quotes that could help make this new school year great. Number 10, science fact. You're here, you take up space, you matter. Number nine, you don't need a cape to be a hero, you just need to care. Number eight, it's everybody's duty to give the world a reason to dance. Number seven, life is tough, but so are you. Number six, no matter who you are, someone's learning from you. Number five, give people high fives just for getting out of bed. Being a person is hard sometimes. High five. <laughs> <laughs> Number four, be somebody who makes everybody feel like a somebody. Number three, you, you're awesome. You were made that way. You were made from love to be loved to spread love. Love is loud. Number two, if it doesn't make the world a better place, just don't do it. And my number one favorite kid president quote is, if you can't think of anything nice to say, you aren't thinking hard enough. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Did, uh, did you have um, anyone with you from your school family tonight? My mother, my baby brother, and my principal, Dr. Crum. Would you all stand and be recognized? <laughs> thank you for joining us. Madeline, thank you so much for those inspiring words. Actually, as a board, we have had the opportunity to uh, listen in on a couple of kid president uh, presentations, and so I um, think that was really apropos for us tonight. I enjoyed hearing the, your favorites. Thank um, you. He's really funny, and he has some really smart things to say, doesn't he? Yes. Lots yeah. of great words to live by. Thank you again for joining us tonight. You're welcome. We move on to recognitions tonight, and uh, we will be uh, led through this section by uh, Ms. Diana Galata, 
and she'll be assisted tonight by board member Mr. Butch Harper. It's my pleasure tonight to present the Technology Leadership Award. The Department of Information Technology selects an IT staff member each year to be the Technologist of the Year. The winner of this de designation is selected by a judging committee of non-IT department staff members. IT staff members submit nominations to the judging committee for consideration. The staff members consider the Technologist of the Year designation to be very prestigious. Award winners are not only at the top of their game when it comes to technical ability, but they also exhibit the best teamwork, creativity, leadership, and innovative spirit. To receive this award is recognition of something very special in the staff member. It has since occurred to the IT department that there are schools and departments that are also worthy of such a prestigious designation. Therefore, they created the Technology Leadership Award. This award recognizes a school or department that is not only at the top of their game when it comes to technical ability, but also exhibits the best teamwork, leadership, creativity, and innovative spirit to make big things happen with technology. In future years, employees from across the division will be asked to submit nominations to a judging committee who will then select the winner. However, given this is the inaugural year, the IT department wanted to select the, the first winner on their own, especially given the reason behind the selection. Kickatan High School was selected specifically because of their work to create the Student Operated Technical Support Center. This effort benefited everyone, teachers in need of fast and responsive technical help, students in need of real world work experience in the technical sector, and IT in need of more staff to handle the ever increasing demands for support. They succeeded because of the KHS commitment to find a way to make it happen, to, get, to dedicate the time to work out the logistics, to work as a team, and creatively to build it. So we are very excited tonight to present this award to Kikatan High School. And Mr. Harper, if you can uh, grab the beautiful Crystal Award there, and we are going to present that uh, to Paul Lawrence, who is uh, here on behalf of Kikatan High School. Mr. Lawrence, mm -hmm. uh, what can I say? You've already been picked as the it person, IT, <laughs> uh, of the year. And any award of the year is most gratifying. Um, simple words cannot express how we feel about employees like you on our staff and the impact that you have on our children. So keep up the good work and take this fifth down. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Harper. Thanks, Ms. Galata. I'd like to thank the division for this award. Um, I accept it on behalf of our staff, uh, especially Mr. Caldwell, our technology specialist, and Mr. Irvin Hall, who directs the student-led uh, technology help desk. Uh, since my time in Hampton, I've been impressed by the division's commitment and Kikatan in particular's commitment to embracing new technology and putting it into our students' hands and letting them run with it. And, uh, we look forward to uh, facing all the new challenges that technology brings and all the adventures that are going to come with it. So thank you so much again. I'd be remiss if I didn't read what's on this. Ham City Schools, Kinkerton High School, Technology Leadership Award 2013-14 to Mr. Lawrence here. Thank, thank you, sir. You thank you. And congratulations again to Kikatan High School for their leadership in technology and I think that program we had a report from them last year in one of our board meetings and it certainly serves as a good model for other schools to develop a similar plan of action okay. in um, using student based uh, technology IT desks and so forth because um, I think we all occasionally need a little technology help so congratulations again. Kikatan. We move on to our consent agenda tonight. It is um, 
consists of items 3.01 through 3.08, includes personnel report 14-15, certification of the closed session of July 30, 2014, minutes of the school board meeting of August 6, 2014, minutes of the school board meeting of August 20, 2014, minutes of the school board retreat of August 23, 2014, the certification of the closed session of August 6, 2014, the certification of the closed session of August 20, 2014, and the release from compulsory attendance religious exemption. Is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move approval of the consent agenda as posted. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Kilgore and seconded by Mr. Henry that we approve tonight's consent agenda. Is there any discussion? There being none, Ms. Bowers, will you call for the vote? Mr. Harper? Aye. Ms. Henry? Aye. Mr. Kilgore? Aye. Mr. Pearson? Aye. Mr. Samuels? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Ms. Muggler? Aye. Motion carries. We move on to superintendent and staff reports. And I will turn things over at this time to Dr. Shiflett. Thank you, Ms. Muggler. Um, at our last board meeting, you heard about some of our summer school programming, and tonight, we wanted to continue the discussion about some additional activities that we had available to our young people. And so I'll turn it over to Ms. Bain. Thank you, Dr. Shiflin, Ms. Mugler, Mr. Pearson, members of the board. You know, it's always my delight to be here with you. Tonight I'm especially delighted because in about a minute. We can't hear you. I think the mic needs to be there closed. There we go. I'm, one second, I was trying to get Daryl's presentation open. Come on. Board. There we go. I apologize. Just trying to get that board report up. Um, Ms. Muggler, Mr. Pearson, members of the board, and Dr. Shiflett, I'm always delighted to be here before you, but tonight I'm especially delighted because in about a minute I'm going to turn this all over to my very competent colleague, Daryl Rogers, and a team to present to you tonight. As Dr. Shiflett said, yeah, last, at our last meeting we heard about the wonderful summer school experiences we had. And in a little bit, we'll talk about the start of a brand spanking new school year. But first, I really want you to hear about what I've begun to call a summer of innovation in Hampton City Schools. So with that, I'll turn it over to Daryl. Thank you, Ms. Bain. Dr. Shiflett, Madam Chair, members of the board, thank you for this uh, time to talk about the summer of innovation programs we had here this summer for Hampton City Schools. My name is Daryl Rogers and I am the out of school time coordinator for Hampton City Schools. Part of my responsibilities is to work with great community partners to provide extended learning time opportunities for our students, which includes the summer and as well as after school opportunities. So this evening we're gonna talk about our summer programs. We'll have a presentation by Miss Deanna Dunn Nelson from Bryan, Bryan Elementary School about the SOAR program. I will um, come back and talk about STREAM and the future plans of STREAM. And then we'll hear from Ms. Kathy Johnson about the Gators Presidential Scholars Program at Andrews. Our summer programs were SOAR, STREAM, and GPS. They ran from June 23rd through July 31st. We served over 200 students this summer from K through eighth grade. We also had very high daily attendance. We had increased reading and writing math skills great positive parent and student feedback from the summer. And our students had um, increased awareness in STEM concepts as well as STEM careers. At this time, I'll let Ms. Uh, Deanna Dunn Nelson talk about our SOAR program. Okay. Hello, um, I'm Ms. Deanna Dunn Nelson and I work at Bryan Elementary as the data coach. Um, but this summer I had the opportunity to coordinate the SOAR camp, which stands for Students on Track for academic results. Um, it ran for six weeks, so two weeks longer than normal summer school, um, so 24 days. We had seven teachers, including a special ed teacher. Um, we had 83 students. Many of them were students that had been in the 21st century tutoring program throughout the um, school year that came over. Um, we serviced grades K through five, so fifth grade was one of the grades at our site. And it was full day, so the morning part from 8.30 to 12 was sore, and then the afternoon part was the stream part, which Mr. Rogers will talk a little more about. I was like, I hope this works. Okay. Um, this is some of our data from our um, program. Um, being the data coach, I deal with data a lot. Um, 
What we did is we kind of looked at it overall. Um, definitely there's gonna be differences among grade levels from kindergarten to fifth grade, but overall we saw a 23% increase in our writing scores when compared to a success rubric. Um, our spelling, we saw an increase of 10% overall on the DSA, which is one of the things we use through UVA. Um, our, as for our reading, right now we're waiting for our DRA scores to come in from the beginning of the school year to see the increases from the end of the school year to this year. So we're eagerly anticipating and waiting to see the increases there. Um, and our math, we had a 12% increase from our pre to post test. And again, this is overall for K through five. Oh, that way. Um, our enrollment again was 83 students. Um, our school-wide attendance percentage was 89.4%. Um, that's a great number for Bryan Elementary. We often have students who are sometimes tardy or don't always come consistently, especially with summer school, but we really use the afternoon stream part, the field trips and all to really entice them and keep them coming. Um, I'm not sure if it's on this slide, but we had, I think, close to a quarter of our students had perfect attendance, had attended all 24 days, which is just remarkable and wonderful. Um, we had a heavy focus on reading. We focused two and a half hours on reading, one hour on math. Um, we partnered with UVA, and they provided not only training at the beginning, but they also provided modeling and coaching throughout the six weeks to support our teachers who not only use it during the summer program, but now are going to use it as well during the school year. Um, these are some, this is some information from our parent surveys that we gave out. So of 83 students, we got 52 survey responses, which was great. Um, many of them even wrote back some comments. 98% agreed or strongly agreed that their child's reading skills improved throughout the program, which is one of our main focuses at Bryan. So that was great to hear. 100% um, believed their child benefited academically. 100% agreed that their child enjoyed the program, which is just as important as the academic piece. 100% agreed in wanting to continue the SOAR program next summer. Many of the comments were about being able to come back or have this program again, so that was awesome to see our Brian parents asking for that. 98% agreed in wanting to continue the STREAM program. This is one of the quotes, and then we had many write in. One of our parents wrote in, I believe due to this program, my child will be better prepared for next school year, which was our ultimate goal. So it was great to see parents write in those comments. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dunn Nelson. STREAM is a holistic approach to STEM. Uh, it stands for science, technology, and then we added the R for recreation and redirection. We believe those parts were key. We also have engineering, engaging academics, art, and math. So it's the holistic approach to teaching STEM. Stream, about stream, it focuses on higher level thinking skills through the use of problem-based learning. Our problem-based learning is how stream is operated, and we'll get into that in just a minute on the next slide. Each day, students receive the lunch and snack daily through one of our partners in USDA. We had enrichments every week. We used ACE Tennis, which was actually a curriculum that helped with language arts and math and also taught the students um, tennis. And they, it was a national program that they came in and taught our um, teachers how to, how to actually implement this program. It was a great program. Alternatives Incorporated helped us with uh, self-esteem for our students. We also had 4-H that pr presented healthy habits for our students. Junior Achievement came in. They were a wonderful group as well. They worked with uh, career readiness with our, with our young students. And Championship Chess is another national curriculum that actually taught children how to play chess and use math uh, skills to do that. And there's a, a picture of them playing and learning how to play chess. Uh, each, each program at Aberdeen, Bryan, we had 10 highly uh, qualified teachers, two coordinators, and actually at Bryan we also had a summer family connectedness teacher. And what was unique about that family connectedness teacher is that uh, we bring in parents all summer long to really stay engaged throughout the summer. And we had um, an opportunity to, for them to come in with their students and the students taught them how to actually use the technology design loop and they got to build a project, a STEM design project with, their, uh, with the parents and students. And then we also had a, uh, another program at the end where all, we had over 40 parents come out to our end of the year program. So that was pretty successful in our parent, parenting program. 
As you can see here, we had many of uh, field trips this summer. The unique thing about our field trips is that they tied into exactly what we were doing uh, each week. Our each week was themed. For instance, our first week, we worked on Earth's environment and the SOLs that related to Earth, Earth's environment. And in that, we were building um, animal habitats. So of course we went to the Norfolk Zoo that Tuesday so the students can get a realistic approach of how animals really live in their habitat. So as they designed it, they had a better, uh, was it better to implement it. Our stream partners, here's a list of all the partners that uh, we had during the summer. And not only during the summer, but they also worked with us during the school year as this is after an after school program as well. Um, so you'll see a, a numerous amount of uh, partners. And our partners provided uh, approximately about $15,000 in in-kind donations during the summer. This is a great picture of our students. We're actually at the Mariners Museum here, and they're learning how to crab. And they really enjoy that, that project here. So how, how does stream work? This picture here shows that our teachers have to go through um, a rigorous training and we, we teach from the children's engineering design loop and that has five steps to it and that is the technology design loop and what happens is the students first must identify a problem second they have to brainstorm solutions third they have to create the solution and, and find out what's best fourth they have to test their solution and fifth they get the chance to evaluate their solution so as they're building um, their stem projects they have to go back and after they test it to evaluate did it work and, and go back and figure it out. If it didn't work, what can we do better? So our teachers are um, in the picture. They're actually getting training, and they, they actually uh, love the participation themselves. Here we have a teacher's point of view. This is a short video of a teacher talking about the program. Uh, my name is Kim Pearson. I'm a music teacher at O'Brien Elementary School. This summer I had the privilege of working with the first graders and we did a lot of amazing activities um, from building bridges out of mush, not mushrooms, but marshmallows and gumdrops and we made solar cookers where the kids were able to um, create pizzas or nachos and s'mores and use the solar energy. Um, so they, they had a lot of fun. It's been awesome. I hope that you all continue this program every summer and even throughout the school year. I think they got a lot out of it. And that was Miss Pearson. Earlier I talked about each week is themed. We have six weeks in the summer and each one has a project-based theme. And in this picture here, you actually see one of our students on our last week, which was working with solar energy and solar cooking. Um, he's there with his solar oven that he made making nachos outside. So the um, STEM is based on experimental weekly projects and themes. We gave you the teacher's perspective. Now we want to hear from the children's perspective. I like when uh, we made we made the s'mores and we um we made the the solar cookers and we um put the solar cookers in the sun so we can um so we can cook the pizza and stuff and uh, we had uh, nachos and pizza. <laughs> as, as you can see, he really liked the food from the solar cooker. <laughs> so. How does stream look during the, week, during the week? In the summertime, on Mondays, we start off with our research and identifying the project that we want to do. Tuesday, we take our uh, project-based field trip so the students, as they have begun their process of research, and they can actually see how it's implemented in real life. And then on Wednesdays, we do more work on our project-based learning. And then we bring in the community uh, for enrichments for those days. Thursdays, every child that builds a project has to do an oral presentation. And doing that oral presentation, they get a chance to present and practice their oral skills. So it's really good for them to get up in front of uh, their class of 60 or 70 students and present. Again, daily, we have a lunch snack, recreation, and mentoring. And, and this student here, you can see she's working hard building uh, her bridge out of marshmallows and uh, toothpicks. In this last video is a parent's perspective. We've heard from the teachers, we've heard from the students. We wanted to give you a chance to hear from the, te uh, from the parents. My children thoroughly enjoyed the summer. Um, they really liked the program. I hope it continues next year. It's great. Uh, my son's reading has gone up. His, his fluency, uh, his math skills have gone up. 
this was a very, very good program. They love the field trips. So yeah, I hope it happens again next year. So where are we going with the f in the future with STREAM? We are already at Bryan and Aberdeen. Machen and Bassett are actually going into their second year um, for after school programming. And we have added Barron and Booker for new schools um, for this coming up school year. So we are expanding. And also I'm glad to um, mention that in 2015 we have added a new partner in the Boys and Girls Club as we received the new 21st Century Grant at Lindsay. So we'll be running STREAM for the middle school age groups uh, at Lindsay this coming up year. And at this time, I'll, I will let Kathy Johnson come to the podium. Thank you, Daryl. School board members, school leadership, thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you um, our successful collaborative partnership with Hampton City Schools. As some of you know, Alternatives has been a collaborative partner with this school division since 1981. And no, I was not around then. Thank you very much. Um, but the Gators Presidential Scholars Academy represents the latest collaboration that we have. And for you as board members, frequently you're put in a position about funding. And as an executive director, I fully appreciate that concern. So I will tell you that this is funded through a blending of funding. It is funded by a 21st Century Community Learning Center grant that Alternatives and Hampton City Schools applied for together. It is also supported by funding that Alternatives receives from the Corporation for National and Community Service that pays for additional staff support in the form of AmeriCorps National Service members. And it is also supported by the alignment of Alternatives with United Way funding. So we are blending funding and that is a strategic decision because then it allows for higher degree of sustainability when one particular funding stream might go away. So with that said, um, who are we and what do we do? And what did I do here? There we go. So who do we serve? Our scholars are targeted and focused at Andrews, Hunter B. Andrews, pre-K-8. This is a middle school program, so it's a little different in the summer for middle schoolers than it is for elementary school children. Um, I like to say that in middle school and high school, students vote with their feet. Either they come or they don't come, depending upon how they enjoy it and what's going on in terms of their engagement in their life. To explain and understand the summer, we have to go back and look at the academic year because this is when we started at Andrews. And in the academic year, our target was to enroll 100 students, six through eight, that were referred by teachers, administrators, or parents. And those referrals could be for academic achievement issues, it could be for social and emotional, but usually it was referred, a student, student was referred because there was some concern about their success in being able to really achieve academically at the middle school level. And during the academic year, we saw that of the 100 that we enrolled, we had 75% that attended 30 days or more. So why is that important? Well, the national benchmark for the Virginia Department of Education for consistent attendance in an after-school program for middle schoolers and even for elementary is if they attend 30, or 30 days or more during the academic year. So that's a high benchmark. So 75% of ours did, which is above the state average. Then we looked at our own, you know, we're not, it's not okay to hit just the state average. We want to exceed it, right? So we set a benchmark of 70%, which is 65 days or more, and 32 children, 32% of the children attended 65 days or more. So of that 100, we then said, you can come for the summer. And so 42 of those children then chose to continue in GPS during the summer months. And 85% of those attended 21 days or more and 75% 36 days or more, which for middle schoolers we thought was a good good thing. So what was our schedule? Our schedule too was Monday through Thursday. We were just an afternoon program, 12.30 to 4.30. And part of that was because many of our students were in summer school during the morning. So they continued, it was held at Lindsay, so there was no transportation issues in terms of summer school to our program. Snacks and transportation were provided again through partnership with um, the USDA. So what did we do? Well, our focus too was on STEM, and what we did was we took, out of the six weeks, they were two week kind of intervals. And so the first two weeks concentrated on animals. And then we looked at animals in the water, animals in the air, and animals on the earth. And so the first week was project-based learning that was done by tutors from Hampton City Schools. The second week were field trips that related to the things that they had learned in the first week. So in the second, the second week of that um, category, they went to Bluebird Gap Farm, the zoo, and did an SPA service project. And just a little plug for the SBCA, we had to pay no 
uh, fee or anything for the SPCA in terms of the extended field trip that they allowed our students to do because our students painted a wall for them. So we learned the barter system when it comes to community resources, which is a good thing. The second set of weeks, we looked at the environment, again, from the perspective of water, air, and earth. And those field trips happened to be with the Mariner's Museum, the Tour de Trash, and Grandview. And then the second, the last uh, segment had to do with Hampton and, U and Virginia history. And that was, again, from the perspective of water, air, and earth. And so we went to Ron's Fishing, the Virginia Air and Space Museum, and the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame and Museum, which, as I understand, was one of the best field trips of the entire summer. So these are just some pictures because a picture is always worth a thousand words. These are kids at Grandview, and you see our AmeriCorps members with them during their experiments. This is another uh, problem-based learning project that the students did. And the value of this, and I think the value of any out-of-school time in summer-based learning, is that it allows the teachers to get into a different role in terms of their instruction and allows the student to participate more as um, in independent and stand in front of the classroom and really have more of an act active experiential role in the learning. They also were engaged in fun and service, and this is a picture of their service project when they were painting a wall at the SPCA. And more pictures of their service so how did we staff it? We have a project coordinator that is employed through alternatives, Shereen McHenry. We have four certified teachers, and those teachers are all employed by Hampton City Schools, with the lead teacher being Kyle Hetrick, who's uh, a teacher at Andrews in the middle school. And Kyle and Shereen serve as the liaisons to make sure that we link what happens in the school day with what happens in the after school. We are also supported then by 17 national service members that are serving at alternatives through AmeriCorps. And these national service members provide the daily support in terms of relationship building, mentoring, instructional assistance to the tutors, and family engagement. They will make phone calls to parents, they will go see parents, they will encourage the students. Um, they just provide an enormous amount of supplemental support. So therefore, we have a very low adult-child ratio. In the academic year, we have a ratio of one adult to eight children. In the summer, we had one adult or young adult to eight to three children. So that's an amazing low student-adult um, ratio. In terms of our evaluation so far, um, we have achieved our enrollment, enrollment goal of 100. We exceeded, actually, our average daily attendance benchmark. And we do have, as the elementary school students, we do have positive feedback from our parents. Now, when you, um, if, if you've done surveys much, you know that it's a little harder sometimes the older that the student gets to get parent surveys back. But we had about a third of our parents to return surveys. And of those who returned surveys, 80% answered yes to the question, had you seen improvement in your child's motivation to learn? Because from alternatives point of view, we're about the social and emotional health of a child. And we believe that's a great partnership with Hampton City Schools because your focus is also on the academic success. We happen to believe that a child's not going to academically succeed unless they can manage themselves and work effectively in a group. And part of that is part of that is what drives their motivation to learn. So increasing their motivation to learn was incredibly important to us. The other thing that the parents reported was that 60% said that they had seen an improvement in behavior, and that was behavior at home. And so parents were very excited about that. The last thing I will say is that from an other evaluation point of view, that when you look at the um, the benchmark of those students who came 70% or more, um, we had 56% um, that passed their SOLs, their math SOLs. If they came 30 days or more, that decreased to 46%. What we know in terms of best practice for out-of-school time is that the hypothesis is the more consistently a child comes to a high-quality out-of-school time program, the more likely they are to bridge the academic achievement gap. And so that's our baseline data, and we have three years of grant funding to make sure that we are on track with what the national best practice is. And so far, I can say that we are. Now, while I cognitively believe in data-driven decisions, as I know you do, they do not speak to my heart the way that stories do. So I'm going to close by telling you two stories. The first story has to do with the, a with the young student. It was, they were part of the, remember that we only registered students who were actually part of our GPS program during the school year. And so we had all the registrations, and we had this registration from a young, uh, young girl, and we couldn't find her student ID number. And so we said, well, let's just wait, you know, until the first day of summer programs and see. And so she comes, and so Shireen goes to her and says, you know, 
can you tell me a little bit about your, you know, what class you were in at Andrews? And she kind of hung her head and she said, you know, I really don't go to Andrews. I go to Eaton. And Shereen said, well, how did you get into this program? Well, you know, Eddie lives next door to me and he goes to GPS and he really loves it. And so he snuck home a registration form for me so that I could also go to GPS. Now for me, that is a sign of a successful program. When you have a middle schooler who is sneaking to get into your middle school program, then you've done really well. My second story has to do with a letter that a parent wrote, home, wrote to us regarding the impact that she felt like that we had had on her daughter. And so I would like to read that because remember my heart is about the social and emotional well-being of children. It says, to whom it may concern. I would like to elaborate about the experience my daughter received during the 2013-14 school year from the Gators Presidential Scholars Academy. Prior to attending this program, my daughter was very shy and soft-spoken. With this being her second year in middle school, I was afraid that she would end up with the wrong crowd just because she was afraid to speak up for herself. Since being in this program, she has opened up to me more about things, we have a closer relationship, and I feel confident that she can handle herself. I am no longer afraid of her being picked upon because she has developed so much confidence. This is something that we have tried to teach her at home, but we do know that sometimes it takes a village to help raise a child. I just want to say thank you for all of the work you have done, and I'm very happy to say that she will be attending the program again in the 2014-15 school year. I would like to end this by saying, keep up the good work, exclamation point. I am quite sure some other kids have gained that self-confidence they need to make it throughout middle school and beyond. So in summary, I would like to say, as Ann Bain likes to say, that this is an example of the Hampton Way. It's the way that we, through collaborative partnerships, make sure that we are doing the best that we can and helping to develop the potential of all children every day. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. At this time, we'll take questions if you have any questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Great report. <coughs> what sounds like some fabulous results, and we look forward to hearing some of the additional results as they come in. But, um, Questions from board members, comments? Mr. Harper? Mr. Rogers. Yes, sir. I got to tell you, my man, there's some excellent stuff there. Thank you. Uh, often our kids turn to the violence that's available in their neighborhoods because they don't have alternatives or options. And some of these kids, especially the field trips is what I'm speaking about, yeah. they never leave their neighborhoods in the summertime. Yes. They never ride across the bridge to go to Norfolk. And it's maybe unbelievable to some people here, but that's, I run the summer programs and kids get very excited. They get very mannerable. That's a tool for, 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 um, for discipline. If you don't be good, you're not, you know. So all these collaborative uh, partnerships, those type of things, right in the center of all that circle there is our kids. And I, I appreciate what you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank I you. applaud you. We thank you. Can I go next summer? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I like that zoo trip. <laughs> Mr. Rogers, my comments uh, will follow Mr. Harper's. You know, during the summertime, uh, sometimes um, parents are not aware of activities uh, uh, that are available to their students, and they ask uh, everyone, you know, what kind of programs are available for their children. There's some involved in summer school, of course, and some involved in programs sponsored by the Hampton Parks and Recreation. But I must say, I think this, the, the stream program is probably the most comprehensive program I've ever seen for students. When you look at um, STEM activities, problem-based learning, the recreation part, I'm glad you added that. That's important. The field trips, community involvement. I hope that this program is advertised as it should be. And I hope that in the future you have the maximum number of students that you could possibly serve during the summer. It's a great program. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Samuel? I don't have a question. I just want to make a comment that I had the privilege and opportunity to attend some of the activities. And I even played tennis with several of the students, which I enjoyed. And your program has demonstrated great results. And I just want to commend you, um, you. Um, Daryl, for extending the, the, the courtesy and the opportunity for the foster grandparents to serve um, in that program this summer. And, and we're looking forward to even increase in our volunteer um, volunteers next year. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Smith? 
I think I'm just reiterating a lot of what everybody else has said, but I just would feel awful if I didn't say something before I left because it's just so incredible. And um, that we're reaching middle schoolers is incredible because um, a lot of times they're they're the middle child. They're sort of lost. So I'm, I love that that's happening. And I, I had looked at this presentation ahead of time, and I always come up with questions before I get here. And um, one was, how on earth do you get 89.4% attendance? And how on earth do you get 100% answers on a survey? But you answered that question for me. You, you're given the whole package to these kids, you're not just academics, but the, the mentoring and, and that family connectedness teacher and the um, field trips and the project. I mean, just. It's the whole package, so we need to do this everywhere. We, we just need to have this everywhere, yes. so thank you. Thank you, and thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you Kyle. <laughs> Our student liaison has a question for you also. I don't really have a question, but when I was in middle school, I would have loved to have something like this. This sounds amazing. It's like summer camp, except you get to learn, too. <laughs> it's great. I'm about to graduate, but I wish I had that when I was at that age. Thank you. Any other, other questions, comments from board members? Thank you so much. Thank you. For joining us tonight. Well, Mr. Rogers, I think you have some work ahead of you. <laughs> um, I, I too want to say a very special thanks to you for all the work that you've done and for the collaboration with our community partners, Ms. Johnson. Uh, thank you so much. Alternatives has been there for us uh, for a very long time. And I was here in 1981. <laughs> and I, you know, I do remember the, the many years that, that Hampton City Schools has collaborated with your organization. So I want to say a very special thank you to you also. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Shifflett? Our next report is about some additional school safety initiatives that we will that we currently have in place for the upcoming year. And I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Cooper, are you going to do introductions or is James just going to come on up? <gasps> Ms. McKeithen, how did I miss you? <laughs> Good evening. I would like to introduce Mr. James Bailey, our head of security for Hampton City Schools, and he's going to present some information this evening regarding our Raptor system. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shifflett, uh, Chairman Mugler, Vice Chairman Pearson, board members, um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, uh, speak to you briefly about two safety initiatives that we're implementing this school year. Okay. We're going to talk uh, briefly about the Raptor Visitor Management System that we've uh, um, implemented in all of our schools, and then I'll talk briefly about our um, um, Blackboard Tip Text line that we've also introduced to uh, uh, support our Safe School Hotline. First, uh, the Raptor uh, VSoft technology system, again, is in uh, every one of our schools now. It is a visitor management system. Uh, VSoft stands for visitor students and other faculty. And um, the company that we're working with, they're out of uh, Texas. They are founded in 2003. They are a uh, top leader in visitor management systems. There are a lot of systems that are out there, but we wanted to look at something that was uh, very uh, user-friendly for our employees as we implemented this throughout the school division. Um, there's over 10,000 uh, plus K-12 schools and communities uh, uh, that use uh, um, this type of system daily. And so far, uh, the Raptor um, system has identified over 10,000 registered sex offenders uh, attempting to gain access onto either school um, facilities or campuses throughout the country. Quite an alarming number. Just wanted to represent uh, um, a map to show that Raptor is pretty much uh, um, throughout the entire nation. There's only three states, uh, it looks like, that uh, are not using uh, the Raptor system. Um, it is used uh, quite heavily here in Virginia, too, as well. In Virginia, there's uh, 330 schools throughout um, that are using this system, and here are some of the other school divisions that are using Raptor, uh, um, the Raptor system. There are other systems out here, um, but there are quite a few that are using this uh, particular system. Okay. Uh, the Raptor system is web-based. Again, it's very easy to use. Um, the equipment, uh, as you see, uh, is a, uh, we uh, currently use a laptop, a label maker, and an ID scanner. Uh, individual come in and uh, provide an initial ID, and we scan the ID in, and it uh, um, 
collects their name and date of birth um, and uh, does a uh, instant background check for sex offenders. That's the only thing that it does. Um, it doesn't check for warrants or anything like that, and just for sex offenders because we want to protect our kids out here. Um, with that in mind, after the uh, initial process is cleared, it, it uh, provides a label uh, to the visitor. Uh, we can track who's in our building uh, pretty much throughout the entire day. Uh, after a visitor um, uh, leaves for the day, we sign them out. If they come back a week later, uh, we can provide, uh, pull up their information without having to scan in their ID initially. Um, and it's an easy tracking tool. Some of the other features that we like, there is an emergency panic button on the software. So if a teacher or staff member that's signing in, a person needs to use that button, uh, we have it programmed to notify our security department. Obviously, it's not a 911 system, but it is an added tool uh, um, that provides a staff member um, access to, to uh, either seek security or uh, the school resource officers that are in the building. Um, it's primarily a visitor management tool, but there are some other um, areas that we that uh, um, that are we're utilizing. There's a volunteer uh, component on here, so we can track hours for volunteers that are throughout our buildings um, throughout the year. Um, we can um, pull up customized reports and. Uh, um, other tools that we like, if there are custody issues or protective orders, uh, we can um, develop reports for that to notify staff members to look for whether a parent is allowed to, uh, you know, go in and meet with a child during that time, or if there's a protective order against somebody that can notify the staff members. So it's ultimately all all for the safety of our children out here. Um, how we implemented this, the uh, Raptor system, of course, um, we provided staff training. We had two representatives from Raptor Technologies come out uh, August 11th through the 14th and provide training. Uh, they actually went to every school and provided training to the staff members of each school on how to use the, the product. Um, we've um, um, provided posters at each school. Uh, the superintendent has sent out a letter to all the parents to inform them of this ne uh, new safety initiative. Um, we've also added information on our website and sent out connected message to as well to try to um, brief the parents on, on the process that we're doing with the Raptor system. The other initiative that we uh, um, um, developed and, uh, is the Blackboard Tip Text um, line. It's 757-273-7912. Um, we wanted to provide an alternative to our Safe School hotline. Um, and with this new approach, uh, we thought that we might be able to uh, uh, receive more feedback from parents and students if uh, they're able to text in tips, um, be it for safety or suspicious activity at bus stops, you name it, or safety concerns or positive comments. Um, they just simply um, put the number into their uh, text messaging on their telephone, uh, type in the message, and send it out. They will receive a reply message from our school division that says thank you for uh, sending them the message that we'd follow up to our security department. And uh, the messages route to our, my cell phone and email, as well as um, the online uh, Blackboard tip um, uh, software. So we have uh, plenty of uh, ways for the message to get sent out to us so we can follow up on, on these important messages. Um, of course, what we want parents to do is just talk to their students about that. that yeah, this is another tool and another way to reach out to parents to, to try to get feedback if there are safety or security issues, concerns. Um, uh, I know that some parents uh, may not feel comfortable with leaving an actual message through our Safe School hotline, and this is yet another anonymous way for parents and students to be able to do that. Um, tip text, of course, is not a... Uh, um, um, a means to supersede 911, obviously, or, or work with the police department. Um, if there's crimes that are occurring after hours or in the neighborhood, this is simply for an added tool for parents and students to provide feedback uh, for safety. So we want parents to spread the word to their, their children. Um, last slide. Of course, we are going to still maintain the Safe School Hotline 727 call or 2255 parents. We will uh, um, monitor this uh, telephone number 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, where students and parents and other uh, community members can also um, provide safety tips or, or concerns that they might have for, for safety. 
Um, and that's pretty much it for right now for the two initiatives. I uh, just want to know if you have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Uh, questions from board members or comments? Mr. Harper? Mr. Bailey. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Explain briefly the buzzer system. Uh, what is that the, part of the... Uh, this is, this is a, a, a collaborative part uh, to that, but the buzzer system is a, a different component. That's yet a, a third initiative that we installed last year. Uh, parents, uh, we wanted to make sure that we secured our doors to make sure that we do not have uh, people that are not on our property uh, trying to go into our property without a proper permission. So the buzzer system uh, um, allows us to secure our doors a little bit easier to uh, um, monitor who's coming into our building. A uh, parent will come in, they'll push a buzzer, and we'll greet them, and, and based on the business in the school, we'll allow them into the now school. Who answers the buzzer? Uh, usually it's the main office staff that are there. There's a monitor where they can see the person that they're, uh, um, that's up at the door, and they can speak back and forth with that person. Because I've seen in a couple of instances where that one person in the office there is, among the other duties, are also answering that buzzer. That Do all schools have resource offices? Do all schools? Uh, no. No, the resource officers are assigned primarily to the middle schools and high schools, and they do have the vertical teams at the elementary school level. Would it be beneficial if the resource officer had something to do with checking that person to hit that buzzer? Because the office staff is running thin. Right, we and understand to do that. that. And all the other things they do. I, I think that would be a challenge to, to have them uh, stationed in the main office to be able to, to have to do that on a daily basis. Um, they are, obviously, they can be trained to, to assist if, if they feel there's a need for that, but we want to primarily make that a, a school division function. So that means that if there's only one staff person in the office, that person is charged with Checking the buzzer also. That, that is true. I mean, it is a, a quick process, though, uh, with the buzzing uh, people in. And uh, we've trained multiple staff members. It's not just one person. Uh, um, multiple staff members, administration, uh, you know, also assist with a lot of those tasks, uh, especially at the elementary school. All right. Other comments or questions from board members on this report? Mrs. Smith? I just had one quick question. Sure. The tip text, um, how are you going to promote that to the students so that they know that's uh, how? We've uh, developed uh, posters, worked with uh, Ms. Galetta and the uh, graphics department, and uh, actually sent out posters uh, uh, last night. The school should have received them this morning uh, to put out throughout the building um, okay. of both numbers, the hotline number. And I believe we're getting ready to send out a, a letter to the parents, too, as well. Excellent. And yeah. connected. That, yes. That's great, because then the parents can help. Try to spread that, the word. So great. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Samuels? I have a question. Regarding the Raptor system, um, if someone walks up to the Raptor system and put in their information and they're a registered sex offender, and how is that, um, how is the staff alert? Is there something comes up on the monitor or the screen? Yeah, yes, it does. A staff member will sign them in and, and will uh, show up a screen of a possible alert. Okay. And the, the staff member uh, can either select, uh, yes, that's positively the person based on pictures and the information the provided, okay. or no, it's definitely not, or, or it could be a maybe, and there's some other indicators for them to look at. Um, and based on what decision they make, if, if there is an alert, uh, the, the phone is, uh, alerts, uh, I receive a message into mm -hmm. my cell phone. Uh, we also receive an email message, and we're getting ready to uh, um, uh, put in the uh, resource officer's telephone numbers, too. We've been working with them to get updated numbers. So they'll be alerted, obviously, there at the school. Um, okay. Again, we're not here to rush out and, you know, with police department blaring, I mean, we're, we know that there are, are offenders in the area, and we, uh, you know, want to make sure that our schools are safe. But, but we, as a school division, are going to work with the community to make sure that we <coughs> provide the, the services that we need if there is a person that, that needs to uh, receive school support. Other questions or comments from board members for Mr. Bailey? Okay, thank you thank very you. much for that report tonight. Dr. Shiflett? Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Well, yesterday was the first day of school, and as is our tradition, we always give a back-to-school um, report on the first school board meeting 
after schools have opened. And it seems to be the tradition that the newest member of the executive director team gives this report. So Dr. Haynes, <laughs> turning it over to you. That's what I was told as well, Dr. Shifflin. So <laughs> next year, I don't know who that will be. Is it the newest member or You're the newest member? You're still the newest member. Good evening, again. <laughs> Good evening Mrs. Muggler, <laughs> Mr. Pearson, school board members, Dr. Shifflin, and members of our community. I am very pleased to have the opportunity to share with you an update on the opening of school. Each year, the school opening brings anticipation and excitement about the learning and growth that, of course, is ahead. The first day ends with parents and families asking, how was the first day? And we worked very hard to ensure that the students will respond that it was great. <laughs> this student, in particular, one of my favorites, was very excited about starting kindergarten at Bryan Elementary School on yesterday. On our first day, we welcomed about 20,000 pre-K through 12 students back to our schools to kick off a wonderful school year. Thoughtful planning and preparation are key to a successful first day for all. As a division, we spend several months working to ensure our students and staff have a great first day. Focused professional development for our staff members is an integral part of ensuring student success. With the new iPad program or the one-to-one -one initiative, much of our training was developed around preparing teachers to use the iPad most effectively in their classrooms. Our maintenance and facilities department was also very busy this summer, completing necessary renovations to improve our school buildings. Pictured above is, is a renovated bathroom at Smith Elementary School updated windows at Phillips Elementary School, and ceiling work at Bethel High School. Our maintenance and facilities department is also putting the finishing touches on the Employee Health and Wellness Center, which is slated for opening this fall. The purpose of the Health and Wellness Center is to improve access for employees for certain health care services, increase employee awareness of their overall health, Support, empl support employees in practicing healthy behaviors and in improving overall employee health. We welcomed several administrators to new, new roles this school year, including Lynette Nelms, interim principal at Bryan Elementary School. Davis Middle School also welcomed a new principal, Mrs. Violet Whiteman. Mr. Jeffrey Mordica returned to Hampton City Schools this summer to serve as principal at Kikatan High School. In addition, Tiffany Hardy and Kevin Davis began their new leadership roles at Hampton High School. Mrs. Hardy serves as the principal of instruction, and Mr. Davis serves as the principal of operations and a new governance model. We're also very excited about several new initiatives this school year, including the one-to-one -one initiative or the iPad program. The goals of the <coughs> iPad program include improving student achievement, increasing student engagement, and enabling personalized, personalized learning. In an effort to ensure, and Mr. Bailey spoke about this already, in an effort to ensure the safety of students and staff, Hampton City Schools has initiated two new safety efforts for the 2014-2015 school year. The division will use the Raptor VSOFT system to better screen visitors. This system allows schools to produce visitor badges and electronically check all visitors against registered sex offender databases. Visitors to the school buildings will be expected to re report to the main office where they will provide photo identification. Once the identification is scanned in the Raptor VSOFT system, school personnel will be notified whether or not the visitor is on the sex offender database. We have also added a new way to report concerns. Tip text is an easy confidential tool that allows you to use your cell phone 
texting application to report incidents or suspicious activity related to bullying or anything that may impact the safety of our students and school community. And of course, the number is, as Mr. Bailey already mentioned, 757-273-7912. We thank our school board for the tremendous support provided in order to live our mission to ensure academic excellence for every child, every day, whatever it takes. That concludes my presentation. I would like to add that the first day of school was always like a second Mother's Day to my mom back in the day, so I'm sure many parents were happy at the start of the school year <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Haynes, You're welcome. for your report tonight. Uh, I, I kind of hope you get to give it again next year, but I'm not going <laughs> to. Yes, Are there questions from other board members or comments? regarding Dr. Haynes' report tonight. Okay, thank you so much. Dr. Shiflett? Our next report is an update on our staffing and Ms. Ruth? Good evening. Um, just wanted to give you a final update on, or potentially a final update on our staffing for this year. Um, we started the school year with still, um, we're actually, we now have six math vacancies. Last time I spoke to you, we had seven. Um, so we have hired one math teacher. Um, we do have some in the pipeline that we're taking a look at right now. Um, but rest assured, each, each of our math classes is covered by a, a highly certified instructor. Um, as we had shared with you, we've got our coaches who are currently filling in for the, the vacant teaching positions. Um, we are also still looking for one early childhood special education teacher and a reading specialist. Um, so Suzanne and I will continue with job fairs. We signed up for one at Penn State um, that's in October and we are going to one in North Carolina in November um, in hopes of finding some, some really solid November, or December graduates. Mm. Any questions? Questions from board members for Ms. Ruth on her update. Okay, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Dr. Shiflett? Our last report for the evening is our <clears throat> beginning of the month business operations financial update uh, by Mrs. Scott. Good evening, Mrs. Muggler, Mr. Pearson, Dr. Shiflett, members of the board. I am pleased to present to you tonight the final report for fiscal 14, uh, summarizing the result of our operations and our final revenues and expenditures for the year. Um, for the year ended June 30th, 2014, and based on our revised budget, which as you recall, had a $600,000 increase um, based on projected revenues in June, our final expenditures for the year are 197 million, or excuse me, revenues, for the year are $197,295,345. This is just under $303,000 less than the revised projected revenue. You see the explanations next to the various line items, but overall, the bulk of that unrealized revenue was the fact that we did not do the e-backpack purchase. When we did the $600,000 increase, we anticipated the potential that perhaps the VIPSA e-backpack purchase would be made prior to June 30th, which then of course would have provided us with the reimbursement. Uh, the decision was made to defer that purchase into this fiscal year. So because we did not make the purchase, we don't get the reimbursement. So that really is the, the bulk of the unearned revenue. On the expenditure and encumbrance side, our final expenditures and encumbrances are $196,565,903. And again, based on our revised expenditure budget with the $600,000. This brought us under budget a total of $1,032,174. Um, what you need to remember is that we can't spend more than we earn. So although that was a million dollars under what was budgeted, it was $729,000 under what we earned, uh, the difference between the million and the 302. So we actually have uh, 
carryover funds of about 729,000. Um, I, I see the categorical transfer on the deliberation agenda. Did you want me to save that discussion for that or go into that now? I wasn't sure. Um, we'll take it up then. Take it up then? Yes. All right. Well then, are there any questions on this? You've just wowed us with so much information. Well, well all right no then. <laughs> I'll be. Yeah, I have Daniels. one question, Ms. Okay. Uh, and this may come up in the um, um, next report, but for the purpose of our community audience, I have a quick question. What is the mm -hmm. difference between a one-time carryover funds versus reoccurring funds? Okay, when we have money left over at the end of the fiscal year, uh, it automatically reverts to the city. The city is our appropriating body, and when we have money left, it is considered to be local funding, and it reverts back to the city. Um, we have, in the past, on, on rare occasions, we actually don't do it very often, have asked the city to reappropriate funds that we had left at the end of the fiscal year. But they are very specific that when we request that carryover money that be reappropriated, that it be for a one-time use. Uh, a one-time use is defined as something that is purchased, paid for, and you're done. Mm -hmm. So you're buying technology, computers or iPads, you're buying school buses, you're buying software, um, anything that you can purchase one time and it's paid for and there's no further commitment to spend money for that item. A reoccurring cost is anything that if you do it, it will continue to have a cost associated with it in subsequent years. Generally, this falls into the compensation category, mm -hmm. so anything related to salary or benefits is going to be a reoccurring cost because you're, once you have granted that salary or benefit, it's going to continue um, and, unless you take it away again. Now, there are non-personnel costs that could be recurring. For instance, you could enter into a lease where you're making payments over more than one year. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the time when we're talking recurring costs, we, we're, we are talking about salary or benefits. Thank Does that you. answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Thanks. <coughs> Any other questions mm -hmm. for Ms. Scott? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Dr. Shiflett? That concludes our reports. We move on to the hearing of any delegations or presentation of any written communications or petitions. Ms. Bowers, would you please share our protocol? Citizens are invited to address the school board on matters of public concern about the school division. Speaker forms are available prior to the start of the meeting. If you wish to address the school board, please complete the form and give it to the clerk. Each individual will have five minutes to speak. All comments shall be directed to the school board. Speakers may not yield their time to another. Speakers should address the school board with decorum on policy issues and refrain from personal attacks. Speakers shall not address matters involving individual employees or students as these topics may violate confidentiality and are not appropriate in a public forum. Presentation of resolutions, declarations, proclamations, manifestos, awards, or other similar documents not originated under the auspices of the school board or administration is prohibited during the public comment period. The audience is asked to be respectful of all speakers. Public comment is the school board's opportunity to listen to the speaker. Since our purpose is to hear from you, the board will not engage in dialogue with the audience or whomever is at the podium. Matters requiring a response will be directed to the superintendent for research and response. The superintendent may report back on such matters at a subsequent business meeting session as appropriate. The school board carefully considers your comments as we decide matters that are brought before us. We appreciate your attendance and your input. Thank you, Ms. Bowers. Our, our first speaker tonight is Mr. David Dietrich. Good evening, members of the school board, administration. My name is David Dietrich, 139 Wilderness Road. It saddens me to see in a city of 140,000 how little interest there appears to be uh, in such important matters as our public school system. I come here month after month 
to uh, attempt to, uh, to see some action by our school system on what I consider very important uh, strategic um, uh, issues uh, affecting our school, ch uh, school children in general. When it comes to school security, I, I see a, a, an ongoing uh, lack of concern for the real security of our school children. We have these gun-free zones that are our school system, our school campuses, the school properties, where our children, the majority of our children, are unprotected by armed security. And I, I, it, it continues to amaze me how this school board, this school administration, uh, refuses to address this very serious issue. Not only will you not address it or, or, or have a, a real solution offered to the public, but you won't even discuss the matter. That even bothers me more. And, it, and it's, again, it saddens me that the people of Hampton are not standing here to hold you accountable. And, and so I can understand why you don't feel like that you should be accountable to a single Hampton resident that comes before you month after month. Um, you, don't, you don't see a reason to because I don't have very many people standing behind me. But there are a lot of children standing behind me. And I think that's the crux of the matter. And I don't see you really looking at it uh, from that perspective. We have resource officers, armed resource officers, at our high schools and some of our middle schools. That's good. But what about those other schools? You know, according to FBI statistics, one-third of mass shootings are over in five minutes. Do you really think those resource officers at other schools can get to a, uh, an unprotected school in time? Nearly half of mass shootings are over before police arrive. That's the situation we have in our school system. And I just don't understand why you refuse to address that. Armed resource officers aren't the only option. I've brought this up time and again. Other remedies are available. Capabilities are not necessarily costly. They can easily be done within our school budget. When will you address this issue? Moving on to school performance. Strategically, what is the purpose of a school system? I, I'll ask you that again, and I'll continue to ask you that. What are we doing here with our school system? A number of good programs were discussed and presented this evening. I, I, I can say uh, they're, they're worthwhile. But what is the ultimate purpose? What should be the ultimate purpose is to prepare our children for the future. But I don't see strategic goals specifically addressing that. What are the numbers you're looking at when we have today half of our schools are accredited with warning, that doesn't tell me we have an exceptional school system. What are you doing to address that situation? That's what I would like to hear from this school system, this administration, and this school board. That should be at the top of your agenda when you have these meetings. How are you going to make our school system exceptional? How are you going to make it superior to every other school system in this region? I don't hear any discussion on any of those issues. Let's get down to brass tacks and really d do what's right for our school children and stop worrying about all these other things that don't really matter. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Dietrich. We move on to items for action. Uh, beginning with item 6.01, which is the revision of school board policy JL fundraising. We have, um, in addition to that, two more policies and a new 
school board policy. Is there a motion to take these individually or do we want to take them as a block? Madam Mr. Chair. Kilgore? Sorry, Mr. Kilgore. <laughs> Madam Chair, I move that we uh, take them as a block and approve action item 6.01 through 6.04. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Kilgore and seconded by Mr. Pearson that we approve uh, tonight's items for action, which consist of item 6.01, the revision of school board policy JL fundraising, revision of school board policy KJ advertising in schools, item 6.03, which is the revision of school board policy EDC, authorized use of division owned materials, and item 6.04, which is a new school board policy GBEH and JHCL regarding lactation support. Is there any discussion? There being none, Ms. Bowers, will you call for the vote? Ms. Henry? Aye. Mr. Kilgore? Aye. Mr. Pearson? Aye. Mr. Samuels? Aye. Ms. Smith? <coughs> Aye. Mr. Harper? Aye. Ms. Mugler? Aye. Motion carries. We move on to deliberation, and our first item under deliberation tonight is the categorical transfer. Ms. Scott, would you address the board on this issue? Yes, ma'am. All right. To kind of tag on to the financial report that we did for June, we now need to request a approval of a categorical transfer. Um, as we go into year end, we typically use our year end funds for purchases that are on our replacement schedules for technology or school buses or textbooks which is what we did this year. Um, in doing so, we ended up needing money to be moved between categories in order to accomplish these purchases. So our final, um, our final budget, as indicated in the, in the previous report, is $197,598,077. But the individual categories need to be adjusted from what they were originally. The $600,000 that was approved in June was put into Category 9, Technology. But in addition, we also need transfers from Categories 1, 2, and 4 into Categories 3 and 9 in order to cover the year-end purchases. Category three uh, is transportation, and that was the purchase primarily of school, new school buses. And category nine is technology, and that was primarily the purchase of replacement um, computers. And so therefore, the to obviously the total categorical transfer nets out to zero, but the individual transfers, it's uh, just over a million, just under a million four from category one, a little over 200,000 from category two, and about 116,000 from category four, going into category three, 535,000, and into category nine, a million 155. And this uh, allows our expenditures to be within the approved budgets for each category. Um, and I would respectfully request that if possible, the board move this to the action agenda tonight so that we can give that to our auditors. Okay, thank you, Ms. Any, Scott. Any questions? Questions from board members on the categorical transfer? Is there a motion to move this item to action? Madam Chairman, I move that we um, move this item on deliberation to our action agenda. Second. It's been moved by Ms. Henry and seconded by Mr. Kilgore that we move item 7.01, categorical transfer, to action. Is there any discussion? There being none, Ms. Bowers, will you call for the vote? Mr. Kilgore? Aye. Mr. Pearson? Aye. Mr. Samuels? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mr. Harper? Aye. Ms. Henry? Aye. Ms. Mugler? Aye. Motion carries. Moving on, we come to item 7.0. Um, Ms. Mugler, I think I would like to propose a motion now that we approve um, the categorical transfer as presented. Second. This has been moved by Mrs. Henry and seconded by Mr. Kilgore that we approve the categorical transfer. Is there any discussion? There being none, Ms. Bowers, will you call for the vote? Mr. Pearson? Aye. Mr. Samuels? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mr. Harper? Aye. 
Ms. Henry? Aye. Mr. Kilgore? Aye. Ms. Muggler? Aye. Motion carries. Now we will move on to item 7.02, which is the revision of school board policy LC with charter schools. Are there any questions or comments, uh, further deliberation from board members on the revision of school board policy LC? Mrs. Smith? Um, I just had one question. On the bottom of the first page, there's a paragraph about enrollment to a charter school is open to any child who resides in the division. And that says, um, through a lottery process, space available base will be done, except in the case of the conversion of an existing public school, where the students who attend the school and the siblings are given the opportunity to enroll in advance. Is that a, a code thing, or is that um, just recommended language from VSBA, or? It's recommended that, by VSBA um, with, so that they're, in the event that, that you're actually taking an existing school and converting mm -hmm. it, that you're not doing um, a lot of disruption. Is, is that something that maybe in the case of whatever that specific case was, maybe it wouldn't be a disruption? We'd want to leave it open where you, you say you might want to strongly consider having students who attend the school, you know, just to leave that open in the future so you're not tied to that where you have to do that and not have a lottery charter school? N not that we have a charter school in the books or anything right now. I'm just thinking uh, ahead of. All charter schools have to be lottery. Okay. But uh, what if we wanted, I know, but what if we didn't want the students who attend the school and the siblings to be able to enroll in advance? What if we wanted to leave it open to be a lottery? Would it be good to have wording so that we had that flexibility? Ms. Bain has approached. I I think maybe I can How help um, somewhat with this. Um, this is a result of legislation that passed during the General Assembly this last session. Um, it was the result of a specific and unique case in Loudoun County. And so this is, in fact, now the letter of the law. So our, our policy needs to be to comport with that. Well, that answers it. Then. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Bain. Any other questions on uh, policy LC with regard to charter schools? Moving on to item 7.03, revision of school board policy ECA, fixed asset control and reporting of loss or damage. Are there any questions or comments or any further deliberation from board members regarding this policy on fixed asset control? There being none, we'll move along to item 7.04, revision of school board policy EI, insurance management. Are there any questions from board members regarding this policy? Any comments or further deliberation? Okay. There being none, we'll move on to 7.05, revision of school board policy EF, food service management. Any questions, comments, additional deliberation? There being none, we'll move on to 7.06, revision of school board policies DO, non-locally funded programs, and DO-R, grants protocol for Hampton City Schools. Are there any questions or additional deliberation on, this, on these two policies? There being none, we'll move on to item 7.07. Revision of school board policy JHCD, administering medicines to students. Any questions or comments or additional deliberation regarding the revision of policy JHCD, administering medication to students? Okay. There being no questions on item 7.0, well, we had the one question clarified on 7.02, but no further uh, questions or concerns regarding these policies 7.02 through 7.07, .07, those will move to action at our next meeting. Moving on to deliberation first read, we start with item 8.01, the revision of school board policy EB, school crisis, emergency management, and medical emergency response plan. Ms. McKeithen is approaching the podium to give us some clarity on these revisions. Good evening, Madam Chair and Vice Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Kilgore. I'm before you this evening with several policies on the agenda for first read. Um, several bills, as you heard Anne Bain reference, 
earlier uh, were passed in the General Assembly this past spring in the House and the Senate. And as a result of those bills, the Virginia School Board Association provided for us, dated May of 2014, some recommended changes. We have five very minor and should be very painless changes for you this evening. The very first one, Policy EB. Uh, it is a simple change in the name. Previously, uh, it was referred to as the Virginia Center for School Safety in May. The name was changed to the Virginia Center for School and Campus Safety. So that is the only recommended change for policy EB. Okay. Any questions for Ms. McKeithen for further clarification on this policy change? All right. We want to move on to uh, item 8.02, which is EBB, threat assessment of yes. teams. And that policy has the very same uh, recommendation. Again, it's the name change. They reference the Virginia Center for School Safety, and it has been changed to the Virginia Center for School and Campus Safety. That is also the very same for that policy. Okay, great. Uh, let's take these out of order a little bit since okay. Ms. McKeithen <laughs> is, is already at the podium, and we'll just pop down to item 8.04. That's another one of your policies, JHG, reporting child abuse? Yes. This particular policy, JHG, as well as JHGR, the regs, the recommendation has been simply that we not just report a process and an agreement with the Hampton Department of Social Services on how to handle reports for child abuse and neglect. Um, they are recommending that we simply omit um, the language that we currently have that uses school personnel. We are simply going to and have an interagency agreement and a protocol that we followed for years. Um, I made a call to uh, the director of the Department of Social Services uh, indicating we needed a copy of an agreement that we entered into years ago. Um, she was unable to locate that, and so she, along with the department's uh, attorney, are drafting currently a new agreement because they too are bound by this recommendation uh, from the General Assembly, Assembly to have an interagency agreement with the school board and uh, the Department of Social Services. So they are anticipating getting a new memorandum of understanding and agreement to us um, so we would be in compliance with this recommendation. But right now we have and have always had a procedure that we follow. And this policy and recommendation from the Virginia School Board simply says that we have to have an agreement. Any questions or comments uh, for clarity on this on this policy change? Okay. So, yes, Mrs. Um, this is on first read and then deliberation and action. By the time it gets to action, might we have a memorandum of understanding? I have asked. They told me that as soon as they get it, they would get yes, because this also affects the. It employee. Does. I received a copy of the, the, the form that the state has provided yesterday, and we'll be working with Ms. McKeithen to make sure that everything is in place before you all actually take action on the policy. Okay. 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 Any other questions for clarification on, on this policy? Moving on to 8.05 is the revision of school board policy JF. CG, tobacco-free school for students. Okay, and we were actually ahead of the game. We were not required uh, until July of 2015 to add e-cigarettes to our policy, but we did that back in November of 2013. So we were actually ahead of the game. So the only change for this particular policy was an add of two legal references, uh, the Virginia 
Code of Virginia 22.1-79.5, as well as the Code of Virginia 22.1-279.6. So they just added two additional legal references for that policy. And that is the only recommended change for that one. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Further clarification on that change. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Thank McKeithen. you. Thank you. We'll move on to item 8.06, which is the revision of school board policy GBK, tobacco free school for staff. Since that piggybacks right on her last uh, comments on policy, we'll. It does indeed. My comments would probably be ditto. I, it, the changes for the, are for the exact same reason. Okay. It's the same code. Any questions or further clarification on that? Okay. Thank you very much. So we go back to item 8.03, the revision of school board policy JJAC, student athlete concussions during extracurricular activities. I have the owner of this policy as Ms. Mayor. I don't see her. Would you speak to that, Ms. Reeves? Um, Yes, Mrs. Mugler. Um, the principal um, change here, um, actually on page two, um, there is a change under number C um, where our CMT is going to meet and review protocols annually. I think on your copy it has annually um, crossed out that will be put back in. Um, and when you get to page four, the most important thing is there is a new section um, six and it's the return to learn protocol and that was um, the results of the um, acts of 2014 in the General Assembly and it, um, it, it specifies um, what school personnel must do and it's now codified as to what they must do before students come back into the learning environment um, um, with, as a result of being out after a concussion. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Ms. Reeves on this one. policy? Yes, sir. Mr. <coughs> Ms. Reeves, the city recreation department has a provision that says you must have a background check, be nationally certified, and also review uh, concussion, a concussion uh, certification. I guess you call it that because you don't get it. You don't get the certification to coach kids unless football, unless you take that. Is there a provision in there for... Um, the high school coaches? Well, what we do is um, we meet the, um, the code requirements because we have um, trainers um, that are that are third party trainers and every one of um, our, in every one of our programs um, that, that that trainer is there for um, to, to um, check on the uh, whether or not um, there is a concussion and it's actually um, it's required to be that way because that way this this trainer is the one who's making the decision and not the coach and it um, and it um, ensures the safety of the child thank you thank you Ms. Reeves any other questions or comments on the deliberation first read okay there being none we'll move on to informational items and my computer is locking up. The next meeting of the Hampton School Board will be on Wednesday, September 17th at 6.30 p.m. and that will be held at the Rupert Sargent Building. Um, any other informational items, Dr. Shiflett? I do have a few. I attended the State of the City Address today and I just wanted to say how very, very pleased I was uh, to be there and to see the it was just, it was a wonderful afternoon to talk about everything Hampton and to hear our school division uh, spoken about in such kind words and um, to see our mayor uh, get up in front of an audience of over 400 people and talk about Hampton with such passion. So I just wanted to um, say what a, what a wonderful opportunity it was uh, for, um, uh, Ann Bain and I were able to attend today. and. Um, just wanted to say thank you to Mayor Wallace, too. Uh, I will be speaking at the Downtown Hampton Exchange Club tomorrow morning, and I'm looking forward to that. I wanted to remind you about the VSBA Advocacy Workshop is September 11th uh, from 9 to 2 in Charlottesville. Uh, at, on the same day, September 11th at 7 p.m., 
uh, the Hampton Council PGA will hold their meeting. It will be at the Rupert Sargent Building, first floor, in the conference room. And I believe that's it other than your first school board field trip is tentatively scheduled for September 19th at Phillips at 9 a.m. And I'll be sending you out some additional information as we get that set up. Any other uh, informational items from board members tonight? Mrs. Henry? Well, just the, you know, the first day of school is fun. And uh, I had the opportunity to visit uh, Phillips School because I was picking up a critter of mine there. But I went in early so I could see the new windows from the inside because they're dark looking on the outside. But on the inside, they don't look dark at all. So I thought, ooh, this is cool. And uh, they're, they're double glazed and an R factor off the chart. So the, the building is going to be much cooler and warmer as well as looking very attractive. And so that was exciting to see the new windows that are going to be going into other schools of that design shortly, I'm sure. And that was, that was very nice. I visited the campus at Lee, where Bridgeport Academy and the Performance Learning Center and all kinds of kids were excited about their first day. And I got to visit Hampton High today, uh, Mr. Richardson's home, and found it uh, looking very exceptional inside and out. And all the students were hard at work. I couldn't see a single student in the hall because they were busy working hard today. And your teachers had your noses to the grindstone, right, Mr. Richardson? Did you have a good first day? My first day was great. Uh, senior great. year, pretty excited. And uh, it, was, great. it was nice to see everyone again. I never had a great day at school. Mr. Kilgore? Um, I just wanted to uh, thank Dr. Shiflett for joining me yesterday uh, to do some tours of uh, some schools. We visited Hampton, uh, Kickatan, Davis, and Bryan with a couple other schools, but the, those four schools in particular all had new principals. And one thing that was very impressive, not only was the staff very energetic, but we heard compliments um, how excited they were to work as a new collaborative team. So that was great. We also got to visit uh, Langley and um, Bethel. And again, it was amazing uh, how quiet the hallways were, how great the hallways looked, and it, went into an AB calculus cap class and they were giving the teacher the results to a math problem. I thought, and this was second block on the first day and they were doing math problems. So that was a little scary, but it was, it was great. <laughs> so thank you very much. Any other comments or questions, informational items from board members? Okay, if there's nothing further to whoa, come. Whoa. Oh, excuse me, one other thing. Dr. <laughs> Shiflett had one more thing. I did oh, want to make the announcement because uh, we did apply uh, for the school nutrition program, the community eligibil eligibility provision. And um, what, although it was reported that we were eligible at four sites, we were actually eligible at six. Uh, we did get the application in on time as we had always intended to do. And uh, the following schools have been approved, Aberdeen, Bassett, Bryan, Cary, Lindsay, and Tyler. So um, households of all of the enrolled students at these schools will, will be notified that school breakfast and lunch meals will now be provided at no cost to those students. Mm -hmm. And so the notification letters will be uh, sent home to the families. Thank you very much, Dr. Shiflett. Is there any other information? Ms. Do no, I'm so sorry, <laughs> Ms. Mr. Dr. Samuels. Samuels. <laughs> um, I just want to acknowledge um, Shonda Epps for doing such a fantastic job with the C program partnering YH Thomas. And they provided backpack to over 300 families. Um, I believe it was last week or week before last. So kudos to John Casiano. Is he still here? And thank you so much for that collaboration. There being nothing further to come before this board, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>